don't want to do what I did one time is click it here and never showed up there. So I've, I've double checked every time since. We are here because God has asked us, commanded us to worship Him. This assembly is Christians and their visitors, young people that have not yet obeyed the gospel. And our purpose is to glorify God and to thank Him for what He has done in sending Jesus. This is most important to understand. It's the reason why so many come to church. They attend the assembly to worship. They put aside all the other responsibilities of life because Sunday is the day we come to worship. And what we learn and what we do here has a bearing upon our lives outside these walls because we need to be consistent. I want to correct something at the beginning as I made announcements. I said the verse was 112, but it's 122, verse 1, where David says, I am glad when they told me it was time to go to the house of God. <coughs> That talks about attitude, doesn't it? It talks about how we feel. In the last several weeks in March, which is coming to an end so quick, we've talked about we are one. It's talking about the unity that Paul emphasized us to proclaim and protect and preserve in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. It talks about the seven ones that we can unite on. And that is recognizing God and His great gift of His Son Jesus as a sacrifice on the cross. I was thinking and trying to find a scripture before I stood up. I remember where it says, I owe a debt that I could not pay. And he paid a debt that he did not owe. Might be a song, might be a verse, I'll make sure. But that's a good point about why we are here. Young people, I want you to look around and see all the gray heads, see everybody that's older than you, and recognize that they are here because they want to be here. And they come Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Notice their good example. Notice what they are doing with their lives. They're putting God first. And we encourage you as young people, you have much to learn. You need to learn about Christianity. You need to learn the gospel. You need to have a desire to please God. And one day... When you learn enough and realize you are a sinner, that you can become a Christian. That day will come. Your parents will help you learn. We'll help you learn in Bible class. I will help you in these sermons that I preach to you. To help you gain a, a, a perspective of this life is not all there is. We are here in our human bodies, but our human bodies will end one day and we'll die. As the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9, <laughs> verse 27, it's appointed to, unto all to die, and after this, the judgment. Young people, we are preparing for that day when we will stand before Jesus. And the way we've lived and the way we've obeyed the gospel and walked in the Word will determine whether we are in heaven or whether we will be cast out and live in eternal fire, which is called hell. So this morning I want us to understand 
more about our oneness. What are the benefits? You know, a lot of people talk about things in society and when they're challenged or invited or offered something, they might ask the question, first of all, well, what's in it for me? Kind of sounds selfish, doesn't it? But whether we give our agreement to something or whether we are involved in something, we consider the cost. We think about what will I have to give in order to receive the benefits? Young people know about Boy Scouts. They know about other clubs. They know about athletic teams. And they understand from a young age that whether it's choir or band or sports or some kind of club, something is expected of you in order to be a member. Well, God, when He sent His Son, Jesus Christ to the earth, He gave us an example of how to live. Everything that He did, He obeyed the Father. He said, the words that I preach are those that my Father gave me. And in the verse that was read before our uh, lesson from John 17, Jesus is emphasizing, God, you and I are one. He says, and I have done your will on this earth, and I have given them your name. I want us to think about this more. This oneness was made possible because of Jesus, said there in verse 22, by His sacrifice, by His willingness come to this earth, His obedience to the Father, None of it would be possible without the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. In verse 23, he says, I have come and I have helped him to become perfect. Y'all, I would like to be perfect. Never making a mistake, never thinking anything wrong, getting along with everybody perfectly. But we're not perfect. And that's not what it means. The perfection is living in Christ. And what we cannot do, He does for us. When we yield to Him and when we obey Him. His giving us the right to become children of God gives us that right to please Him. In verse 23, He says, I want them to be those that speak of us to be witnesses of what he's done and then in verse 24 he says all this has been done so that one day we can be with him you know he's not here he's here in our minds and because of faith and he said where two or three are gathered I'll be with you I don't believe he's talking about this assembly, but I believe there's that promise. I'll be with you to the ends of the world. And in our minds, reading the scriptures all about Jesus Christ and learning everything that he did, he's a part of us. He's part of this church. He does this so that we may know the Father, verse 25. And that we can share all of this, verse 26. The body of Christ, the church, the family, all of it is because souls are important. We have one soul. It's destined for eternity. The soul never dies. The body does. In the creation of all things, in Genesis, said this, the, the spirit of man, will return to the Father. But the body will return back to the dust of the earth of which it was created. This body that you, you grip with your hands and you walk with your feet and you talk with your mouth and, you, and your mind controls your whole body, it's only for one purpose. 
acknowledging God and being submissive to Him and loving Him as He loved us. It's our business. If He came to seek and save the lost, that's our challenge also. This fellowship is in love with God and with each other. John 13 says this, by this, all men will know you are my disciples when you love one another. Are we showing that love to each other? Any kind of rift, any kind of disagreement, any kind of argument, any kind of effort to disassociate with someone else goes against God's plan. Church is looking up in praise. When we worship God, we understand that God is in heaven. And we understand that God hears all and He sees all. He sees our hearts and our intent and why we're here. He knows if we're distracted. He knows if we are focused. The church is looking inward. And He's asking each of us to repent. When I do wrong, I need to make it right by repenting and changing my life. And if possible, make restitution for what I've done wrong. We have an outward responsibility of reaching to those around us. By our example, hopefully we're pointing to them too. This oneness, this love of each other, this fellowship that we enjoy. And the church also looks upward for the return of Jesus Christ Himself who will appear the second time and He'll come in the clouds. And those that are in Him, those that died in Him and are continuing to live in Him in the present time when He comes, will all be reunited up in heaven as He takes the bride to the Father. This oneness is a connection between united people for a united cause. It's called the cause of Christ. We live for Him. Everything that we do, everything that we participate in, every plan, every, every decision we make, every friendship that we have, it is for the purpose of saying Jesus is our Savior. And we live for Him. And we sacrifice everything in order to do that. This connection is loving hearts. When love remains, everything is put aside. Everything will be accomplished. Read 1 Corinthians 13. And see the description that Paul gives about love. Love does not consider evil. Love does not count the faults against you. Love forgives. Love unites us. The church is hearts knit together. Spirits sharing together. It's a spiritual house of the saved. That's what all this is about. Because each of us participating and giving what we can in, in service, in work, in energy, in, in agreement, in thought, all of that's important. There's an illustration I've heard and used. This fellowship, this togetherness should be like the Redwoods in California. I've never seen the Redwoods. I've seen pictures. And in movies, I've seen them cut those magnificent trees down. And I'm glad they've limited that the harvest of those trees so the next generation can go and can see it. There's one Redwood called the General that is claimed to be the largest tree in the world 
I just recently saw the dimensions, over 300 feet tall. And at the base, just feet and feet going around the, the bottom of it. But do you know what's so unique about these redwood trees in California? Is they don't grow alone. Their roots don't go very deep. If they were alone and here comes a breeze, guess what? They don't have the foundation, the footing, to be able to withstand that wind. And as tall as it is, it would topple over. But they have discovered how their roots are grown and intertwined together. And as a forest connected at the base, they have a foundation to face hurricane winds because they give strength and firmness to each other as they are intertwined. And that's what the church is in community and in brotherhood. You see, the Lord's church does not exi exist simply to beautify our community, but to personify the brotherhood. To personify is to say, in my person, look at, at my life and the decisions for good that I've made. The church is not a physical building of brick and wood, but a spiritual house of saved men and women who are in fellowship with God and with each other. Tragedy sometimes happens when individuals become selfish and they want to live the way they want to and they fall from truth, they fall from practicing that truth and when they are, they've become immoral, they've become worldly because they bring reproach upon the church, God has given rules on how to deal with them. It's called withdrawing fellowship, disciplining an individual. That's not what God wants though. He wants a family that's together, always working and serving. The church should be like those red wood tree souls intertwined with one another in fellowship, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. You see, without Christ, who gives us that foundation, who is the cornerstone of the church, where would it be? Floundering, weak, falling apart, Dying out without fellowship, church is useless. As God's people, we must fellowship one another in order to demonstrate the love that Christ had for us. And he said there in John 17, I've given them our love to them. Oh, are we fellowshipping? Are we enjoying this kind? There's that demonstration. The love of Christ that he had for the world. Just as he had, as we sometimes say, every person on his mind dying on the cross. That tells us we should have everybody in the church on our mind. Yesterday, three of us went over to Howe for the men's day. And there's probably 150, I'm not sure, uh, and and. Many congregations represented because they wanted to come as men to learn how to continue to be leaders of the church, men of integrity, spiritual men, we call spiritual giants. And what a fellowship that we had that day. We are there for a common purpose. To encourage each other to grow in the Word, and to grow in our talents, in our service. Each congregation needs that kind of uh, man or men in the fellowship. In Acts chapter 2, after the first gospel sermon was preached, we, we read that 3,000 obeyed the gospel because they believed. And they felt the guilt of having crucified Jesus Christ. Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter told them. And when they were baptized in Christ, they were united. And in verses 44 through 47 in Acts chapter 2, we read of that fellowship that they enjoyed there in that first century. We need to respect what happened in that first century because it's a pattern. It's a pattern of the way God 
began the church on the face of the earth. There in Acts chapter 2, it begins at verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Remember Jude in verse 3 when Jude says, I intended to speak and write unto you of our common faith. And then he understood the need of contending for the faith. Luke writes here in Acts 2, we have all things common common. A common faith. A common hope. A common responsibility to live spiritually. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. I don't believe any went without. And I believe if, if it was necessary in our faith here at Central, an individual was hurting or in need and couldn't do it themselves, we would reach in to our pockets. We'd reach down into our very being and give or serve and help them come out of those problems. In verse 46, And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house and did eat with their meat, eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. See that description of the early church where they had this communion? We understand that this communion, this fellowship, is in two ways. Physical and spiritual. In the physical communion, communion we have the, the, the possibility of helping each other uh, in, our, in our lives. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, we do you to know the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, and how that in a great trial of affliction, the, abundant, the, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to that I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves to give, praying with much in, in, entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. The background of this writing is Paul is going around uh, the congregations and collecting funds in order to take back to Jerusalem because the church at Jerusalem is suffering. There's a famine. They're hungry. And Paul takes the leadership. There in 1 Corinthians 16 when he talks about laying by in store, that's the background of collecting necessary funds to go back home and buy food for brethren. Isn't that wonderful? That's that physical communion. But there's also a spiritual communion. When we read about our coming together in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, we all, we all know Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as some have forsaken. But think about what he says what we owe each other. Let us, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We have the responsibility to see if there is a person that is beginning to depart and be wayward from the faith. We go to them and encourage them. Don't leave. We want you. The family of Christ needs you. You're part of us. If you leave, who's going to fill your place? We respect you and love you. Stay. That's what that verse is saying. In 2 Peter 1 verse 1, Peter talks about this, this faith this, that's precious that we have. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout 
who are sojourners of the, the dispersion in, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Lithuania. He's, he's talking about what they have together. And that's so precious. Let's not let it die. And lastly, there's a spiritual communion in that we support one another. We all know Galatians 6 verse 1, where what is taken into thought, you who are spiritual, go to Him and restore to Him. But in Galatians 2 verse 9, notice what he says. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Why is this important? Because some were going to the Gentiles. Some were going to the Jews to preach, to encourage them. There wasn't a division. What was necessary was they were all part of the same faith, the same church. And those pillars, those, those leaders in Jerusalem saw fit to say, we're like-minded. We have the same purpose. We agree with you. Go work. Go preach the gospel. We have the right hand of fellowship in our body. That's one of the benefits. The enjoyment of being able to call each other fellow workers in the kingdom of God in this world. I hope that this series of lessons have encouraged us to know that we're each needed. We each have something to give. We have a place to feel. You're not left out. Don't make yourself be left out. Put yourself into it. Put the effort into the life of the congregation here at Central. We need a teacher. I pray that the elders after worship get two or three volunteers because of you realizing I'm a person, I have something I can give, and I want to help little ones to learn the songs and the stories from the Bible and about Jesus Christ. We are one. Don't forget that we have these benefits as brethren together. Let's strengthen one another with these lessons. If you had the need of coming to Christ Jesus, we offer the invitation. Whatever need you need to express, please come while we stand while we sing.